when seeking knowledge for the sake of power and greatness instead of wisdom and enlightenment. Madness and tragedy often follow. Fiona and I had just crossed back into Skyrim after attending some business in Kolovia, and we stopped at a local inn on the border. There, we were handed a warning. There have been reports of a former Blades living in a camp near Peakshade Tower. Recent reports have also told of Thalmor Justicars slaughtered on the road to Falkreath. Anyone traveling near the old tower should proceed with caution. Fiona? Hmm? I know that is unlikely, but I need to check it out. I've never heard from Grandfather after all these years. So, any rumors of a blade still alive is worth looking into. Not again. I know, I know. But I have to follow every lead. It's probably nothing, so just go on ahead to Solitude. By the way, Baron should be done with my new sword. If you would be so kind as to pick it up and leave it at the tower for me, then you can head home to the Priory. I'll meet you there. Oh, very well. Thank you, my child. <laughs> she just hates when I have her do errands for me. I arrived in Falkreath in a morning raid, which oddly seems appropriate in retrospect. Blizzard, just hold here and I'll be back shortly. The tower should be up there somewhere. Let me head out this way. We'll go take a look for this blade. I'm really not equipped to be doing this in the middle of a rainstorms, but we should be okay. We're just going to go up and take a look. Ah, there's the tower. I know we're hoping that my grandfather's here. But I should proceed with some caution. No signs of anyone here. They said it was a camp, but I don't see anything to indicate actually living here. Hello? Hmm. Hello? What? Khajiit. Surely not my grandfather, of course, but who is this? No blade strong. A warrior. Truly. And who... who are you? You have something to say. Well, save your breath. The way I see it, you don't have much more of them left. Huh. <laughs> Idle threat. I just wanted to talk. Who are you, and you're wearing Blade's armor? Are you associated with the Blade? Talk is for cowards whose Blade say nothing. Hmm. I simply wish to know your name. The son of Cloudula Temple named me the Desert Fang. The Thalmor know me as Des Courier. To you, I am simply Zvashni. The Khajiit who spared your life. Hmm. Savashni. You haven't saved my life yet, and you haven't taken it either. Hmm. Where do you hail from, Rash One? Cyrodiil, fool. From the steps of Cloudwilla Temple. From whence I came before that, no one knows. The blade who had left the service found me as he descended the steps. To him, it was a sign from the divines. In truth, it was just a cowardly mother waiting for the opportune time and a man with forlorn eyes. Having left the order, his eyes were indeed tainted with sorrow, and for that he pitied this kitten when he should have abandoned it. Yet it was his newly discovered faith in the workings of the gods that inspired him to develop the skills for which I'm the caretaker. Sounds like fate to me. The man, obviously not my grandfather, he would never leave the blades. 
but it does sound like fate. The world is full of such tales of fate and coincidence. That's what we burn into our memories. And all the other instances, every day we live without incident, those moments are never ascribed to the laziness of the gods. Just forgotten. Tell me about your sword and armor. If this man was no longer a blade, how did you acquire it? Akaviri, forged in a dragon land. Obviously. With a sword and armor of the blades, sworn to the service of the true emperor. But know this, my sword serves no one. You could be Tiber Septim reborn, and I'll still send you back to the divines with your head in your arms. Again, another threat. I've heard the blades do not recruit those who will not serve. You think on who they were, and not who they are. The Blades are a group of bandits, rogues, and traitors. How dare you! Most of all, they are fools. Fools who couldn't see past their own weakness. Like parasites who cling to the lion's mane. The weak must ally with the strong, and prey the arm flicked off by the stroke of its tongue. It makes no difference whether this Titus Mead is of dragon blood or Skeva, just that his army stands between them and the executioner's axe. If the blades weren't fools, they would measure their emperors by where they seat their Thalmor guests, at the table or on a pike. Threats aside, there is something to say to be truth in your words. You may not be a blade, that is for sure, but I doubt you're just some scavenger. True. The one I killed to gain this armor was indeed a blade, a master of the dual sword technique, and my mentor. He was a man of forty years, and I no older than a dozen. When I first bested him in single combat, yet he was still my better. Our bodies would never be at an age where I could prove otherwise. At sixteen, my mentor had exhausted his use to me in terms of body. I would have granted him death right then, if not for the secrets his mind guarded. And what secrets would those be? The Way of the Nine. Stances and techniques derived from the teachings of the Divines. That was his legacy, and his gift to me, his only pupil. But only when I was ready. A phrase thrown around by masters of all disciplines, who wish to teach their pupils the value of patience. What I wasn't ready for, and never would be, was religious nonsense with which he dressed the art of the kill. Now as I enter my prime, I search for the lesson that escaped into the void when we last crossed our blades. He took you in, taught you all he knows, and yet you despise him. And then you killed him. So, who's the smart one here? You killed the one person who could teach you. Fool, your wits display the emptiness of your mind. It was my mentor himself who stated the stance of R.K. was one passed on through death. I see. Yet it's possible, as R.K. governs life and death, that it was a test of one's scruples, and in killing him, the technique is lost to eternity. Yet if I hadn't struck the killing blow, then I myself would be lost to the void. And that's a trade only imbeciles like you would find worthy. Again with the insults. But, tell me of the way of the Nine. My grandfather taught me the seasons of the sword, but not the way of the Nine. I wish to know more. You will understand little of what I speak. And much of it is of no practical use. 
but facile metaphors tossed around by Dark Man. But I will enjoy watching your brow twitch in confusion as I pass his words on to you. Take, for instance, Debella, the god of beauty. What about the stance of Xenathar? Xenathar, right foot facing east, left foot facing north, swords crossed in a defensive position. When braced together, two blades are as resolute as any shields, and the winds of Xenathar with a shift for those who labor and endure. Hmm. And the stance of Debella, since these are all based off divines? She stands nude, arms raised, cupping a golden flower, pouring cool water over her supple breasts. But here, beauty is artifice. The stance is seduction. The blade raised in the right hand glints like the midday sun, bewitching your eyes while its partner lies in the grass. Deception, I see. I would like to know about Giuliano's stance. Giuliano's teaches that for one thing. No ten thousand. Study closely what is distant and look from a distance at what is close. Bah! Garbled poetry and peasant wisdom. Unnecessary layers of depth that belies what is the simplest of all truths. It is easier to kill a one-armed foe than one with two arms and a sword. The stance of Julianos is designed to disarm, quite literally, in fact. The tip of the blades nearly scraped the ground, sweeping upward to catch the crook of the elbow where the joints meet and the flesh is exposed. I see you're missing the point of the Julianos stance. It is the analysis of the opponent knowing where his weak point lies, and that allows you to disarm him, but enough of that. Tell me about Kinnereth's technique. The stance of Kinnereth. Both blades pointed upward to the sky. Power sacrificed for stealth. Just as we know not from where the rain falls, the blade's vertical position masks its angle and its target. I am curious about the stands of Talos. Talos. Mortal man ascended to the divines. The front foot faced the opponent, just as Talos faced the armies of men. The back foot faces the rear to the invisible plane of the eight. Two swords pointed north and south, forwards and backwards in an open stance. If you only see the mortal man, you'll neglect the hidden divine. As is the nature of Talos. And the stance of Stendar, what does it entail? Stendar's mercy. The only technique of the nine that utilizes a single blade and a single cut. Mm, you have my interest. As two warriors pass on the road, the blade is drawn from the scabbard and returned in a single motion. Twenty paces later, a red gash will appear on the victim's neck, no thicker than a cat's hair. Thirty paces later, and the gash will form a crescent as pearls of blood trickle from the wound. Fifty paces, and the line has run full circle, the blood dribbling onto his collar. And what happens beyond 50 paces? The victim reaches for his neck, and upon touching it, his head topples over. So 51 paces, Traveller, from where you stand. That's where you can exhale. Despite your odd delight in that technique, we'll move on. Tell me about the stance of Mara. The embrace of Mara. Both blades held out horizontally to create the illusion of an opening. Love too can be a source of bait. In this case, the love of blood. And 
Mara's blades close faster and hold tighter than any trap. Intriguing. Do tell me about Akatosh. I am interested. Akatosh, the dragon god of time. And what's better but timing? No different than a bard's tune. Dance to the beat of a throbbing heart. The stance of Akatosh is in an offensive position. A series of flurries that disrupt one's timing and rhythm. It's designed to stagger an opponent and end the fight quickly. But should you fail, you will fall to your own exhaustion. An overwhelming assault. An all or nothing play, I see. I am interested in how you killed your master, being that your training was incomplete. It snowed that night when it should have rained. My mentor looked at the sky and said Kynareth was all out of tears. And I said, Kynareth does not cry for fools. We drew our swords and dashed through the trees, our feet rapping against the snow. The night before, I had chosen my stance. While most would use the flurry of Akatosh, the technique is too violent. I could kill my mentor and lose sight of the very thing I sought to learn. And in the spiritual sense, the father does not come before the son. So what stance did you use? It was the defense of Xenathar that shielded me from his attack. If I saw both his blades as swords and not shields, I could parry, if not kill. Our blades clashed, but made no sound. Muffled by the snowstorm, his swords came at me from all directions, but I kept my eyes on his feet. Or more precisely, the tracks he left in the snow. There was a pattern there. If only I had more time. The stance of RK. So you switch stances, hoping to learn more. To Akatosh, I went for the flurry and the kill. Yet when I saw his blade rise to the block, I hesitated, only to see that very blade run me through. It was then that he revealed the true essence of the technique. I assumed he moved to protect his life, and his stroke came for my death. But the blade missed my heart by the width of a cat's hair. I made no such mistake with his neck. And so you killed him. You chose Akatosh, the wrong technique, when what you needed was more defense to gain you the time to learn the stance of RK. And yet you killed him. Just like that, it was over. I dropped to my knees and reached for my potion as his body drowned in a cascade of snow. I tossed the half-empty bottle beside his severed head and said he could have the rest. When he didn't respond, I couldn't help but laugh. All of it, the tracks, the blood, and his legacy washed away in a tide of white. I had a desire to kill her then, but I knew I'd be no match for her, so I left her. Still, I was intrigued by the way of the Nine and wished to know more, but for now I was short on leads, so it would have to wait. My next clue in my search for the way of the Nine came weeks later while in Riften. There is a crypt near the Gerald Mountains long believed to be a burial site for the Blades. As there have been reports of ghosts and hauntings, travelers are advised to stay away from the location until further information is culled. I rode through the mountains surrounding Riften until I found it. Sky Shadow Crypt. Carvings? Clearly Akaviri are at morn. What in the blue blazes? In Talos's name, what is going on here? Don't think me that place. So 
Those blades are sacred. Savashni? Sacred. What have you done? So dull they can't even shave your beard. This scroll, on the other hand, may point me to what I need. Curse you, grave robber. RK, take your soul. RK. Blasted RK. 99 fools, life and death, delivered by my blades. And not once has the stance of RK shown itself. You hear me? You cannot hide from me forever, my mentor. Ah, so the fool comes to dance once more. But it seems I've slain all your partners. For what reason have you done this? I didn't come to here to fight with you. Then you are still too late, and too stupid to comprehend why. They are one and the same. Or have you come to sharpen your fangs? No. In that case, the blades you seek are not here either. The spirits. What is this place? Who are those spirits? A sanctuary for the ghosts of the Akavir. My mentor once spoke of it in passing. Now all those ghosts have passed. It seems one of these ghosts was a greedy one. He had two legendary blades, a way where the others would be blind to his duplicity. Why are you here? What blades are you speaking of? Tell me about these swords you seek. One is as light as a feather. And as fast as the arrow it fletches, its edge doesn't appear to be as fine, but that's deliberate. A light blade with an edge is brittle, and this sword is as sturdy as it is swift. The other is as sharp and as piercing as a confession. Heavy for an Akaviri sword, the blade meant to ward off blows and struck with force. Both are life and death incarnate. One knows not which role they play. These are the perfect weapons to slay my mentor once more. This is all part of your sick quest to gain the stance of RK. Why are you here? Why else, imbecile, to hunt my old mentor? Yet he continues to elude me, as does his stance. Only the weak rely on others. Forge your own legacy, Savashni. And only a devout simpleton tries to reassemble the wheel. I will build my own legacy, but only after I have absorbed all that is beneath me. It's obvious I'm not going to make any headway with you. You need to stop this, now! But, in the meantime, do you mind if I speak with a priest? I have no intention of fighting you here. At least let me have a word with him. Not at all. Speak with your equal, Patrak Balzagan. I have two swords to fetch. I still have no match for her. Hey, me insane. Stay quiet and follow me. As you wish. Is this place a barrel for Admora and Akaviri? Who is this pilgrim? Maybe he can give me some answers. Now then, we're out of sight of her. Tell me what is going on. Why was she here? What are these blades that you see? What? What? He... He... And a spirit. In the form of a blade. What is going on here? You, spirit, speak with me! Spirit! 
Stop! Gave his body. In their final days, many pilgrims come to sacred crypts such as this one, in hopes of redeeming themselves from a life of sin. They offer their bodies to the ghosts that haunt these halls, so together they may find absolution. You said, I arrived at last. Were you expecting me? I'm no blade. I have. Ever since my death, I have been waiting for you to come, waiting for a sign. Then today, you enter on the heels of my pupil. This is no coincidence. Truly, the gods are great. The gods had nothing to do with it, Ghost. I came here on my own. I seek the way of the Nine. That is where you are mistaken, young disciple. The gods have a hand in all things. For all things were made by the hands of the gods. You remind me of her. She did not heed the teachings of the divines, and now she pays the price. Forgive me, where are my manners? My name is Garrett. I am Zavashni's former master and steward of the way of the nine. I surmise as much. What exactly is this place? Who can say? It belonged to the Needs at one point, and the Akavir at another. As such, the ghosts of Atmora and Akavir roam these halls. It is the latter with which my pupil has quarreled. The Akavir. She thinks that facing me once more would afford her a second opportunity to learn the stance of Arke. Is she right? Will facing you once more in your spirit form give her the stance of Arke? That stance is too powerful. You cannot teach it to her. Yes and no. Technically, it will grant her the opportunity she desires. Yet, without faith, even a million opportunities are as good as none. Hmm. The stance of Arke is based on instinct and flow and the rivers of life and death. It cannot be understood without first understanding the gods. And Savashni hates the gods. She despises them. She'll never accept them. I understand. Without her understanding of the divines and accepting their providence, she has no chance of inheriting the stance of Arche and the way of the Nine. I have no more questions, spirit. What is it you ask of me? To end the life of my disciple and to demonstrate to her the power of the divines. Accomplish that, you must endure what she would not. Only through the pilgrimage of the divines can you prove your worth. When you have walked the supplicant's road, then you will be ready to inherit the stance of Arke. Your disciple is no enemy of mine. What if I refuse? If you side with her, then you may receive the ire of the gods. Perhaps even worse. Their indifference. When I spoke with her, Savashni thought she detected a pattern in your stance. That is wishful thinking on behalf of my pupil. She wishes to believe she is close when she couldn't be more far. My hope was that in our fateful battle, she would experience a divine intervention, as these pilgrims do when the end draws near. If she failed to embrace the Divine's teachings, she would die by my hand. Such is her skill, but this is the outcome we endure. You too will face a similar test, but you do not have to do it alone. I need you to receive the blessing of eight warriors of the Divines. Together you will be able to see the rivers of life and death flow through your stars but only as long as the nine of us are bound to your will. Such is the consequence of shortcuts. 
but we do not have the time for the long road. And how do I walk this supplicant's road? First, you must find a brute of Talos, a warrior whose very breath is a declaration of war. Second, the embrace of Mara. Only one who fights for love will burn the embers. Third, the mercy of Stendar. Claim the warrior whose very weapon is forbearance. Fourth, a tear of Kinnereth seeks the one who walks amongst the beasts and gives life to the soil. Fifth, a mind of Julianos. Only one whose intellect is sharp as my blade will pass this test. Sixth, a mark of Debella. Find one whose beauty is profound enough to melt a heart of steel. Seventh, a scale of Zenithar. Seek the aim of one who fights for coin and tip the scales toward your victory. Lastly, the judge of Akatosh. Only a warrior who claims lordship of the realm of time will light the path. When you have been blessed by eight who are worthy, and the eight flames are lit, then I will stand as the ninth. Now go, my young disciple. And keep the gods in your heart. So to do the bidding of a vengeful spirit, I must seek eight blessings from eight pilgrims, located somewhere in Skyrim.